Last summer, I sat in a Jeep, taking in the view of the expansive green on these mountains, appreciating the opportunity I had to do research in such a beautiful part of the world, Chimborazo, Ecuador. But then I realized we'd been sitting outside of Maria's house for almost an hour and it was getting dark. And pretty soon it wasn't gonna be safe to drive back down the curvy mountain roads we'd come up to get there. Luckily, just then, we heard movement in the house and my research team and I jumped up to go meet Maria. Maria came bursting out of the door, shooing chickens out with her. She had a bucket in her hand and she was headed to the water spout. She looked stressed and in a hurry. I quickly introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Megan. I'm a researcher with the World Bank and Tufts University. And we're here because we'd like to ask you some questions about a child nutrition program you participated in last year. Maria looked at us and up at the darkening sky and said, no, 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 I just got home from work. I have to take the cows to graze. The land where they graze is really far from here. I still have to get dinner ready for the kids. I can't, I don't have time. And I said, oh, that's fine. We can come back at a time that's more convenient, maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow it's the same, she said. And then she looked at me and took a deep breath and something relaxed in her demeanor and she said, okay, come tomorrow, tomorrow I can talk. So the next day when we returned and the door swung open and the chickens came out, Maria stood in the doorway and signaled for us to come in. We sat down. I had prepared a series of questions about the food she served her children to eat, and whether she was able to attend regular health checkups. The questions aimed to gain a better understanding of what she wanted to provide for her children and what she was able to do in practice, and why those two things might be different. Maria is a name I give to her to protect her identity as part of my research, but her story of juggling multiple jobs, tending to animals, agriculture, and raising five children, mostly on her own, are real. It's in moments just like these at the end of the day when she had to make really difficult decisions, like whether to spend the extra time boiling water before she served it to her children, or instead to soothe a crying child, give them water straight from the tap. It's these kinds of decisions and in just these kinds of moments that affected the health of her children and many more in Chimborazo. So you might be asking, what was I, a gringa, doing in rural Ecuador conducting interviews? For me, the answer to that question begins growing up in Boston, sitting around the dinner table with my parents and older sister. We'd each share stories of our day. And for my parents, both social justice activists, those stories would be of their work organizing a rally down at the State House for immigrant rights, or of the difficult conversations they were having on the shop floor, getting people ready for a picket line and what that would mean for their families. My dad worked for the General Electric factories in Lynn, Massachusetts for 37 years. As a union organizer, he fought for social change through the labor movement. In the 70s, my mom left college to travel through Latin America and understand the experiences people faced in other countries. For her, teaching her children a second language would provide them a window into understanding the diversity she knew. So I first learned to read in Spanish, attending an inner city public bilingual school. With other children learning English for the first time. That's me. These are the foundations that gave me the values and the sense of responsibility to continue this struggle for social justice in the world around me. As a researcher at the World Bank, I've spent the past four years studying child nutrition in Chimborazo, Ecuador. This is an area that is both mostly rural and indigenous. It's a place where mothers and fathers have to walk for miles to reach their local health centers, often arriving and finding them understaffed and unable to provide the services they came for. 53% of the population live below the Ecuadorian poverty line of $2.80 a day. And in the most recent census in 2010, 20% of the rural population did not have any type of bathroom or latrine in their house. All structural barriers that have serious implications on child health and contribute to a really terrible statistic. Half of all children under five in Chimborazo suffer from chronic malnutrition or stunting, something that has lasting cognitive and physical impairments for them. So when I first got started working on this issue, I began by listening. I visited local health centers, spoke with daycare providers, and local nutritionists. 
And they each repeated to me a similar challenge. They said, we can provide support and services to parents and children while they're here, but it's at home where the behaviors really need to change. And this is where we don't know what's working. So together with the local government, we began to brainstorm. How could we enter into homes where change needed to happen most? And in 2014, when we got started on this work, one thing most poor households had was a cell phone. And the local government had data on their cell phone numbers. By bringing this data to the policy challenge, we were able to enter into homes and begin to nudge families towards healthier outcomes for their children. To do this, we drew on insights from behavioral economics and psychology about human behavior. We know that all people postpone things they believe are important. We can all relate to decisions we make rationally probably each week in health and nutrition to eat healthy and exercise. But with the pressures of work and school, family life, and in Chimborazo, the context of poverty, these preferences change in moments of stress. It's not that we're inherently irrational individuals, but rather at different moments, we have different preferences. Research in the field has shown that in these moments between the decisions we make and the actions we take, timely reminders of our initial preferences can help change behaviors. In economics, we call these commitment devices, such as making a plan with someone who can hold us accountable. Powerful emotions can also serve as this influential nudge in these spaces, such as the encouragement we feel from peer pressure, social norms, and also from fear. So we took these insights and we developed a program that sent text messages as the nudge, twice a week for about a year. The messages were reminders to bring children in for regular health checkups. We also provided information about the importance of nutritional supplements and vitamins. We provided tips on how parents could practically integrate a diverse set of foods into their children's diets. And lastly, we reminded parents to regularly wash their hands and practice good sanitation to reduce illness. Each of these messages were framed using positive and encouraging language, like this one. Maria, sometimes being a mom is difficult, but we believe in you. You can do this. Each message aimed to communicate to parents and caregivers that they had someone on their team rooting for them and believing in the change that they could accomplish. So about a year later, through a randomized control trial, we went back with a local survey team and surveyed almost 3,000 households, some that received the text messages and others that did not. And what we found was that these messages were powerful. They led to statistically significant reductions in the experience of illness. We observed that households that received the messages were 10 percentage points less likely to experience a range of nine common illnesses among their children. We also observed improvements in nutritional status. Weight for height improved. Children who had had low weight for height levels were shifted into a healthy range. So there are two lessons that I take from this work and I'm really excited to share here with you today. The first is that none of this learning would have been possible without the use of big data and evaluation to test and learn from policy. Maria's story is an important one, but if I were to tell that story to a policymaker, they'd often tell me, we've heard these stories, we're from these towns, but either I don't have the power to make the change I need, or I don't know what kinds of solutions would create an impact. But if you give them a statistic, they can use it. There is power in that number. Data becomes the megaphone that brings the experiences of people often shut out of powerful decision-making spaces into the room. You and your data are part of a growing data infrastructure collected by governments and businesses. We are beyond the question of whether we should be collecting this data. Instead, we already do, and the question now is, how will we use it? The challenge is on all of us to begin to find ways of pulling these different pieces of data together to test and learn and improve policies and ensure that data is the megaphone for social change. The second lesson I take from this work is something I actually first learned almost 10 years earlier as a Peace Corps volunteer serving in the Dominican Republic in a small town on the Haitian border. 
In that role, I held hundreds of meetings, bringing people together around problems that needed solutions. And while these meetings were important, what proved to be most impactful were actually the informal spaces. Sitting down, sharing a meal or a coffee with people, and listening to the struggles of poverty they faced. Listening to small business owners who were over indebted and needed help with basic accounting. Or listening to Haitians whose children were shut out of schools. By listening, by listening we could build solutions. But what was more was that through listening, we built relationships based on the vulnerability of sharing with them in that struggle to get by. These visits, and in the case of Ecuador, the text messages held people accountable to our shared goals, but they also communicated hope. They communicated that someone believed in them and what we could accomplish together. So this second message about hope, it's not some silver bullet naive message that hopeful text messages are, are the answer. Structural barriers remain to be important determinants for development outcomes, such as access to clean water and quality health care. But what I am saying is that in these spaces between the decisions we make about what we should be doing, what we want to be doing, and what we actually do do, in this space, in this margin, I've found that the power of hope and human relationships can make the difference. Thank you.